that will challenge your perception of authority and make you rethink the last 400 years of history, including the birth of America. With that, let me get to my guest, Tupper Saucy. How are you today, Tupper? Fine, Greg. How are you? You know, we, let's get right into this. So, uh, talking about who are the real enemies, uh, what is their plan, and what are we going to do about it? That's what we've been doing today. Tell us uh, how Rulers of Evil fits into this, and uh, uh, enlighten us on who these guys really are. Well, I, I think the facts um, uh, pretty well bear out the fact that the the people who really run the world are the uh, are guided by the militant wing of, uh, of the Vatican. Okay. That's pretty well established. A uh, number of books have done that. Uh, I looked into it and found essentially uh, the same thing. Okay. And uh, the, the question is, what do we do about it? And uh, you know, Before you do that, though, let me get back to this story. I know you, you wrote another book uh, called The Miracle on Main Street uh, regarding the tax situation and got involved in some IRS difficulties and that's how what enlightened you to write this book tell us about that story uh, about how well, you the, started the, this yeah the, the miracle on main street i wrote in 1979 and published in uh, 1980 and it really caught on and uh, became a, a grassroots bestseller and uh, the the book envisioned uh, what might happen if uh, the grassroots americans understood or learned uh Exactly where Article One, Section Ten in the Constitution came from. Okay. Um, what uh, what prompted Article One, Section Ten was uh, the circulation of irredeemable um, federal money. In those days, they were called Continentals, and um, people couldn't um, uh, they couldn't make any kind of plans for the future. Their the value of their property was continually being subject to fluctuation because uh, a uh, debt-issued, uh, uh, central bank-issued um, currency, paper currency that's not redeemable uh, in precious metals, uh, has uh, a value that no one can determine. And precisely, uh, this is what was ruling uh, the America, American property values since uh, really about 1965 when the Coinage Act came in and, and, and made irredeemable Federal Reserve notes a, a legal tender for all debts, public and private. And uh, at that point, um, Congress was given sort of a carte blanche just to, uh, um, to will uh, into circulation as much money as they wanted to. And this caused general, general inflation, and uh, it caused uh, real... Um, vertigo in our sense of what things were worth. Mm -hmm. And today, um, you know, our our money is is, is completely un un irredeemable. And Tupper, how did this get started for you? I know you it had to do with some complications after writing that book, Miracle on Main Street. But tell us that story about your cousin and the yeah, federal prosecutor. Uh, yeah, well, I, Miracle on Main Street was such a success because it had people going into local courtrooms and arguing that uh, no state can make anything but gold and silver coin a tender and payment of debts. That's what Article 1, Section 10 says. Right. Article 1, Section 8 says that the Congress shall have power to coin money and regulate the value thereof as against foreign coin. Well, in 65, Congress stopped coining money and uh, the, the, the kind of money that the states uh, could make a, a tender and payment of debts. And so... We have had a situation when Miracle on Main Street appeared of states enforcing payment in something other than gold and silver coin. And that's a flagrant violation of the Constitution. So uh, people start going into courtrooms just all over the country uh, objecting to uh, the paper currency that the state was enforcing payments in. Yeah, and you're hitting very them, interesting yeah. cases <laughs> came about. I can imagine. And, and it really, it really infuriated uh the system, especially the, the, the people who are benefiting from uh, an irredeemable currency. Uh, the framers called such people the friends of paper money. And uh, so for the friends of paper money have a lot of power in the USA. And um, they, um, I, I got really concerned about uh, what my position was with the IRS, and so I, I was sure that they were going to use whatever testimony I might give in a 1040 return against me in some sort of criminal trial, so I started, I started pleading the Fifth Amendment on the tax on the tax return. Well, it worked. 
uh, one out of three attempts, uh, and the IRS took me to trial. Uh, it's a misdemeanor to uh, uh, to plead the fifth on a tax return, and uh, we we weren't sure of that back then. We mm-hmm. had to go through the criminal trial in order to find right. out. The jury said for the second, uh, the, the last two years. Uh, that uh, that it was not that it was perfectly okay, and so they acquitted me. But for that first year, they thought that I had willfully failed to file a return. And uh, in preparation for the trial, I met my prosecutor. This all happened back in 1984. Right? Okay. And um, so the uh, the prosecutor uh, introduced himself to me, and uh, I began asking him where he was from. He was from Washington, but before Washington, he was from. Uh, New Orleans, and I mentioned my cousin in New Orleans, who was a dear friend of mine, and he said, oh, you're kin to him. And I said, yes. He said, well, you know, we were ordained together. And I said, well, my cousin is a Jesuit priest. Are you a Jesuit? He said, yes, blink. Mm-hmm. And so I, I became I became very interested right then that uh, a, uh, a Jesuit could be prosecuting tax cases for the Department of Justice, working, yeah. <laughs> working in effect for the IRS. <laughs> And so I wondered, well, what other what other involvement in the political system do the Jesuits have? And so when I was supposed to show up the Atlanta Federal Prison Camp in 1987, probably all those years later, mm-hmm. uh, to serve my my one year, which probably would have been reduced on good behavior to four months, I decided that uh, things were a little too heated at the time for me to submit to federal custody, and so I became a fugitive. And I, I remained a fugitive, um, uh, America's least wanted man, for, for about 10 years. And during that period, I researched uh, the involvement of the Roman Catholic Church in the formation of the United States, and it's really an amazing story. And um, I talk about what was going on with the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, at the time during the earliest um, uh, rumblings of colonial descent from from England, uh, began in 1758. Now take us through it a little bit. We'll wet our interest for your book. Go ahead. Well, in, in 1758, the Jesuits got a new superior general who was a, a very skilled diplomat, uh, an aristocrat from Tuscany, and uh, his name was uh, Lorenzo Ricci, the R I C C I. The British called him Lawrence Ritchie, R-I-C-H-E-Y. And uh, Lawrence Ritchie started making some uh, very subtle changes and uh, in two ways. First, he, uh, he, began, uh, he began a promotion for uh, discrediting the Jesuits. When he was, when he was elected uh, Superior General, and by the way, the Superior General of the Jesuits is an absolute ruler, uh, and the Jesuit constitutions... Um, give him a, uh, an actual greater power than the Pope. Okay. And uh, uh, the uh, the Jesuits are instructed in the constitutions to consider um, their superior general as the person Jesus Christ. Okay. And so he, you know, the, the, that's why they call him the Black Pope. Uh, he's he's a Black Pope because he's not seen. He's the, the White Pope is the one that everybody knows the name of. The Black Pope is a guy that. That, that rules uh, from the background and uh, directs the uh, the church in a hostile world because the, the Jesuits really perform very well in what they call hostile missions and 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 it, uh, England was a hostile mission and the Jesuits were trained in those days at a school in in uh, Flanders which today would be Belgium and it was called uh, Saint Omer's. They learn how to uh, do invisible ink, and they learn how to wear disguises, and they learn how to do all sorts of of uh, psychological operations. Uh, they were well trained, and uh, Jesuits were just all over England. And um, uh, it was Lawrence Ritchie who caused the what I call blown cover as cover, uh, the abolition of the Society of Jesus. Uh, a lot of enemies of the Jesuits talk about how the Jesuits have been run out of so many countries. Well, yes, they were run out of France. Yes, they were run out of Portugal. Yes, Spain. Yes, Austria. Yes, Germany. Uh, they were run out of these countries in order, I believe, to make uh, the Jesuits uh, more invisible. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
remember, at the time that the Jesuits were growing in disfavor with the Catholic Church, the Protestants in America were growing more dis- more and more dissatisfied with their British monarch. And so they began to um, sympathize with these uh, poor, bedraggled um, Jesuits who were the enemies of the Catholic Church on the theory that uh, the enemy of uh, uh, the let me see the enemy of my enemy is my friend mm-hmm. and um, uh, one of the one of the staunch supporters of the American Revolution was John Carroll John was a was a Jesuit he was trained at St. Omer's his uh, cousin um, Charles Carroll was the richest uh, American according to John Adams and uh, Charles was also uh, trained as a Jesuit in St. Omer's and went on to the temple, inner temple in London, became a lawyer. And uh, all, of the, all of the carols, uh, John's brother, Daniel, uh, was a sign of the Declaration of Independence. And Daniel, too, was, was uh, a trained Jesuit. And um, the, the Society of Jesus, or Jesuits, uh, used not only the Jesuits, but also the, the Order of the Masons. Uh, the Masonic Lodge is a similar organization to the Jesuits. It's an absolute uh, totalitarian hierarchy, uh, and everyone uh, in the various degrees of Masonry uh, obeys a higher power, and it cul- that uh, uh, Masonic power culminates in what is known as the Unknown Superior. Nobody knows his name. All they know is that uh, they get orders from him, and uh, those orders are, I guess, delivered with some sort of code so that everybody knows that it came from the unknown superior. And I maintain that the unknown superior during the, the American Revolution was none other than Lorenzo Ritchie. So uh, the, the Masonic Lodge was just a wonderful way for Catholic militants to control the operations of Protestants, because Catholics were forbidden to join the Masonic orders, and Protestants knew that. They knew mm-hmm. that the, uh, they 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 apprehended that to become a Freemason was to uh, belong to a brotherhood that discriminated against Catholics. Catholics were definitely a despised minority in America, mainly because uh, Protestants knew that if a Catholic would hold a political office, uh, he would have to be obedient to uh, a foreign sovereign who is the uh, the pope and uh, this is this is true um, this is found in catholic uh, ecclesiastical law that uh, if, if 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 you're a member of the catholic church and you hold political power uh, you are to use it to advance uh, the rights and honors and dignities of the papacy so um, as as the uh, another thing that the Jesuits did, and I found very interesting, and I, I haven't seen many uh, writers on the subject discuss, but the very first publication of Sun Tzu's Art of War in a Western language was published by the Jesuits. Mm-hmm. The translator was the Jesuit um, astronomer to the court of the Chinese emperor. And, uh, by the way, Jesuits have... Uh, they have high positions in just about every profession throughout the world. Uh, they are no slouches. They're really cool people. Let's spend the next five minutes talking about, uh, uh, you know, who these guys are, who the rulers of evil are, how you trace the, the papacy back uh, to the uh, back from the Revolutionary War to present time. And then in the next half hour, let's discuss what we can do about it, how to react to these people, how we can change things. And, and then we'll, in the course in the second hour, when you come back again, we'll get into the nitty-gritty and the nuts and bolts of uh, the, the many hundred years of history involving the Vatican and how they have uh, infiltrated our country. So anyway, pick up where you left off for a few minutes and connect yeah, the dots. The, the, I guess probably the most most important um, pony that a person can have in understanding uh, how uh, the subliminal forces operate is Sun Tzu's Art of War. Um, Sun Tzu is a legendary uh, Chinese um, general who lived, they say, about 600 B.C., and he wrote uh, his strategies for achieving uh, victory. And... Uh, he said that there's nothing more valuable than 
spies and ruses. Um, you have to be deception. All warfare is based on deception. And, of course, Western people had no idea that there was such a thing as Sun Tzu until 1772, when uh, General Ritchie, Superior General of the Jesuits, Lawrence Ritchie, Lawrence Ritchie, caused to be published uh, Joseph uh, Marie Amiot's translation of Sun Tzu in French. Okay. Very, very important uh, publication. Because here, if you could read between the lines, as you read how Sun Tzu said, if you are strong, make it appear that you are weak. Mm-hmm. Uh, in 1758, the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, were a political entity unto themselves. They, they ran virtually every crown in Europe. Uh, they were, they were uh, a, almost a separate monarchy. And uh, everyone knew this. Suddenly, things start happening. The rug appears to be pulled out from under them, and they are kicked out of one nation after another. And they fall into great disrepute. And in 1753, uh, Pope Clement XIV abolished the Jesuits for all eternity. Of course, they were reinstituted in 1814, but nobody knew that at the time. And so in 1773, here, here we, you know, all the, the, the patriots imagine that the militants of the Roman Catholic Church are no longer. Catholic Church looked like it was in incredible decline. So it, was, it suddenly became safe to hang out with guys like John Carroll and, and other Jesuits because they were, they were, they were being held in disrepute by the most hated despot on earth. And, uh, this it caused the Jesuits, I believe, become sort of the brains uh, behind the orchestration of the American Revolution. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, uh, I guess, I guess the readers will, will simply have to have to crack the covers on 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 rulers of evil because it really, you know, I designed it to be a book that that you wouldn't want to put down, and a lot of people keep it on the bedside table and refer to it frequently. You know, read two, three, four pages at a time. You can skip around. Uh, you don't have to read it, um, um, you know, uh, page by page. You can read it, you know, go to chapter 18 and then back to chapter 4. And, yes, there are some there are some fairly tough historical passages with a lot of historical data, but I felt that it was necessary to put all that data in there in order to preserve my credibility because if I skipped around, if I took liberties uh, with the reporting of history, somebody might say, "Well, he's you know he's just guessing at this." But I'm not. I'm, well, I, when, let me backtrack a minute. When you are when you are examining the trail of a clandestine warrior, a guy who is who is uh, trained to cover his tracks, you have to make you have to make some educated guesses because. They're not going to come right out and say yes, we did this. Mm-hmm. You know, they're they're going to always deny it. But whenever an act is done, uh, it leaves certain fruits, and if you know where those fruits come from, you can get a picture of what really happened. And this is why I love the uh, the scripture: that says, "By their fruits you shall know them." Uh, we have to look at the fruits. We have we have to look at the outcome. To see who, who who started it, you know, people are doing that with 9/11. They're looking at the outcome of 9/11 and they're saying, "Hey, uh, Arab, Arab terrorists have have gained less from 9/11 than anybody in the world, so they couldn't have been responsible for this." And then you work back and you see who's gained the most from this, and it points a searchlight at quite different parties. But we won't even get into that. Um, but it's very exciting reading about. Uh, the facts, reading about the acts and deeds of people who have have uh, indelibly influenced the history that we live in today. And, and that's so the many history people that, are yeah. so ignorant. You know, they don't know. They they live in complete uninformity. Well, listen, we're going to try to inform those people, and we'll be back in three minutes on the Investigative Journal. 
back for the second half hour of the Investigative Journal on this November 4th, 2015 day on our calendar. And I'm going back in time interviewing uh, author Tupper Saucy regarding his book, Rulers of Evil. If you haven't read it, please get it. You can go online and uh, find it. Uh, I find it to be a great, great ex exploration into the rulers of evil including, uh, of course, the Jesuit order. Now, Tupper, this interview was done in 2006, and I did a, a second part to it. Tupper passed away, I believe it was 2008 or 2009. And in that time, between then, I spoke with him a number of times through emails and private conversations and found him to be one of the best resources of information that I ever ran across as a journalist. And I remember he was telling me one time what he really wanted was people to pick up where he left off. There's so much more, he says. And he said, uh, go and, and grab some of the information I've given you and add to it. And if you find mistakes, let me know. He was open to that. Uh, and what an enlightening interview. Back to Tupper Saucy. Tupper Saucy has written a book called uh, Rulers of Evil. In chapter one, in a in chapter titled Subliminal Rome, uh, you say, Tupper, that uh, you discovered uh, after several years of private investigation, you referred to that in the early part of the interview, the papacy really does run uh, our foreign policy and our government. Uh, let's let's save all the particulars for another time, our second part, and get on to. Uh, something more important right now, and that is their plan, uh, their New World Order plan, which, uh, by the way, you say isn't new. It's been around a long, long time. And then what can we do about it as Americans? Are we helpless, or can we do something? Go ahead. Yeah, well, uh, the, the plan is simply to uh, maintain uh, the status quo. It's not, uh, as, as a number of commentators have uh, you know, insisted, it's not to... Uh, you know, take control of every man, woman, child on earth and, and restrict freedoms and all that. Uh, I think they would like for people to think that that's what they're after because if they can, if, if they can get people alarmed and get them agitated and excited, you read Sun Tzu and you'll see that agitating your opponent is, is essential if you want to control him. If, if you can cause him to react, and he's in your jurisdiction. He's under your control. Correct. And so one of the things the Jesuits try to do is they try to precipitate reaction because if they can cause the reaction, then they can control the reaction. And um, so I, I, I would suggest that the first thing to do is to understand that if you react, you're playing into their, uh, into their game and you're, you're playing into their hands. So I, I really don't react. I study... And I, I'm aware that their job mainly is the rulership of evildoers. That's why I call the book Rules of Evil. There's a great deal of evil in the world. And uh, uh, evil is, you know, uh, again, I think the rulers of evil like to portray evil as, you know, fangs and, and uh, the horror story, uh, the horror show, uh, the slasher. Uh, idea of evil, Satan worship and stuff, but evil is is simply uh, <laughs> treating your neighbor unfairly or uh, you know participating in, in iniquity. You know that that's what evil is, and a lot of people do that. And I I, I think I you know I'm 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 getting into uh, I'm approaching the age of geezerdom now, and I've been mm -hmm. around for a long time. I've seen a lot happen in America, and I really think that American government has grown evil proportionately with the fall in the moral stature of the American people. I think uh, America's become a fairly evil country, and if you get an evil country, you're going to have to have more evil rulers of evil to take care of them. And um, traditionally, uh, it, it, it takes a... Uh, a really ingenious ruler, to, an ingeniously evil ruler, uh, to rule evil people. If you you try to rule an evil people with a, by a good man, 
And, uh, you know, because the good man, the prototypical good man is Jesus Christ, and he says, forgive uh, your enemies, uh, turn <laughs> turn the other cheek. You get a, a judge or a, or, or a president who has that attitude, and he's just going to get... He's going to get nuked. He's going to get walked all over. He's going to be totally ineffective, um, uh, especially in a world of evil. Good people belong uh, in the community of good people, and uh, uh, they need to, to, you know, I think the essence of being a good person is to rule yourself. Don't look to some ruler, some governor, some some official to rule your life. Don't let him adjudicate you. Uh, uh, scriptures in the New Testament are filled with uh, admonitions not to let the ungodly rule your life. Well, very, very safely be shown and, and, and conclusively be shown that the court system uh, exists for the ungodly. And, and uh, just look at the symbols that they use. Uh, trace the symbols. I have chapters in, in Rules of Evil where I, I trace the symbols all the way back to the very earliest uh, symbols and icons um, ever inscribed by man. And actually trace these these icons back to what must have been the mark of Cain, because it's, uh, it was found in Babylon, and we know that that Babylon is is the is the land that Cain first uh, occupied. And the earliest inscriptions we find there show uh, somebody receiving power uh, from uh, a heavenly body, and the shape of that heavenly body is a is a, is a cuneiform uh, inscription. It's actually an eight-rayed cross, like the double cross. And, well, here. Uh, it's it's uh, it's it's called uh, Anu, and Anu means the god of heaven. He was the great sky god of the Babylonians. You say you say too that there this this new world order is nothing new. I mean, this has been talked about since the days of Rome, and maybe oh, earlier than that. Earlier than that, start started with the mark of Cain, I, and you know, Cain was given. Uh, divine, um, he was given divine protections from anyone who would try to kill him. And uh, let's go on. The plan. Uh, we talk about genocide. Many people now talking about all the horrendous things going to happen, the paring down of the population by perhaps even a half to two-thirds. Now, genocide has gone on in generations past. Wars have gone on in generations past. Fascism has been around in America a long time, not just in the re- since 9-11. Uh, we just haven't been uh, looking for it. Perhaps. Well, you know, the one of the one of the greatest identifiers of fascism in America happened in 1945 or 46, when the two uh, fascists, uh, the two axes, uh, were right. installed yes. on the walls on either side of the speaker's dais and in, in the House of Representatives. I mean, these are the these are the emblems of militant fascism. And uh, how come nobody raised his hand back then and said, "Hey, wait a minute, we just." We just defeated fascism. What, why, why are we installing the emblems of fascism on our walls? Right. Well, anyway, let's say, here we go, though. Here we have, look at all what the uh, New World Order at this point. Uh, okay, look at the Jesuits who are in control, according to you, and many other researchers. Uh, the Vatican, who's taken their stance, uh, hiding behind the papacy, hiding behind goodness when in fact they are doing evil through these people in our government and governments all around well, the world. Well, it's, it's the thing is they're, they're doing evil in order to regulate and manage evildoers. Okay. You know, all's fair in, in war, you know. And, and there's, a, there's a wonderful uh, Latin uh, maxim, a legal maxim about war. Uh, in time of war, the law sleeps. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, our, our rulers of evil in America are very careful to say we're having a war on poverty. We're having a war uh, against terrorism. We're having a war on drugs. The Cold War. As long as they can keep the people consenting to a state of war, then the law can sleep. Exactly. And, and so so uh, I think it's very, very important for a person to to call in his boundaries, not extend his consent, into uh, into into rulers of, of, of evil, you know, uh, to let um, you know let him rule himself according to the the very best system that he can find, and if he finds that the American legal system is the best that he can find, well then good luck. I think right. there's a better one. And yeah, so here we go. Uh, you celebrate diversity, <laughs> right? So here here's a person now. You say don't get trapped into their game of uh, basically 
anger and frustration. And right, Greg. Very important. Don't be angry and don't be frustrated because that's what they want you. They want you there. Well, you, you're a lawyer. You know that, that a, a lawyer, a, a good litigator, loves to get his adversary angry. Because exactly. Do that. He's won. Because once you do that, once you get him away from the issues. Yeah, he can't think. You know, and, you know, you're always looking for your conclusion. You know where you want to end up. It's how you get there that's important and not to jump to conclusions. And what uh, what I see here, and this is really good advice, I think, is that faced with these people, knowing it's been going on for hundreds of years, I want to get your reaction on how a person, uh, first of all, how can, let's say uh, we are good people, and there are a number of good people in this country, they want to get rid of these evildoers. They want to get rid of, they want to uh, get rid of this Vatican control. We have a hard time even knowing who they are. The way they operate. So, what what is your suggestion to a person listening who has come to the conclusion that he thinks he knows who the enemy is? He thinks there's a huge problem that fascism is going to take over all his rights. How do we react? What can we do from your perspective? Well, the fascism is not going to take over all his rights. Um, if if he if he behaves as an evildoer, fascism will take over all his rights. And um, but if he if, if he if he does well if he does good and he learns what good is and he learns what the you know what the fruits of 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 acting good look like and he shows only those fruits well his rights are not going to be trampled okay and, and so he's he's really he really doesn't have much to worry about he can really live a good and free life and i all i can do is just point to my own and, and to, to my own life because i live a very Good and uh, you know my agent Peter Fleming wanted to call Rulers of Evil a how-to book. You know, <laughs> you, know, you read read the history, do your homework, learn who all the dramatis personae are, and then pattern your life on that, and you can live a really wonderful, trouble-free life. Because they're not gonna, they don't want to take everybody's rights away. They're not going to take everybody's rights away. They're going to take the rights of people who give them a hard time away. I don't give them a hard time. Right. You know, uh, Jacques Ellul said that Jesus Christ looked on the Roman government with quiet derision. That's that's a good term, quiet derision. Just let them be. Let and, them. I mean, they're doing their job. And so they're, they're ruling evildoers. So basically, you say let the evildoers rule the evildoers, and let let's them, grow. Right. And guess what? As guess good what? people, they, and rule if, ourselves. Right. If they come after me, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, what am I doing that they perceive as evil? Mm-hmm. You know, and so, uh, uh, you know, what, I guess what I do is I say, I guess my, Well, what if my, they perceive evil as some, you've, you've exposed them. Do you understand what I'm getting at? Many people uh, don't even get down this road of exposing who these guys are. Maybe they'll think that's evil. Well, you see, that, here's, the, here's the thing. It wasn't enough for me just to expose them. I started to stop. That's why it took me ten years to write the book. Okay. Because because I, I you should see some of the early drafts of these of this book. As I made these discoveries, I was ranting. I was jumping up and down, and my fists were pounding on the table. I mean, you, there were exclamation points about every other sentence. You know, can you believe this? You know? <laughs> and, but the more drafts I did. The more I reflected and digested what's really going on, that these people really do have the right to be there. Hey, I'm glad evil people are ruling the evildoers around me. Because if good people were, the evildoers would just run all over them. Right. So I need, you know, it takes a thief to catch a thief. <laughs> it, it takes a real wicked person to rule wicked people. And so I'm, you know, I hate to call our our, our, polit- our politicians, you know, wicked or evil people, but I'm sorry, you know, I, uh, that's I, I'm not a court of law, and I'm certainly not going to uh, sentence them to any, uh, you know, any fine or punishment or anything like that. This is simply a conclusion that I've made based on their fruits. Huh. You know, I'll tell you what, it's kind of a progression just in talking with you uh, from learning uh, what the evil do or who they are and going through a, you have to go through a, 
a rigorous, uh, basically taking yourself through a history lesson again, but but one that's not presented to you. You have to uncover it because they hide it. Uh, yeah. And once you get to the point of figuring out what who they are, then you got to figure out what to do against them. That's and I think, it, Greg. That's so important. Yeah, it it does no good to know who they are. Yeah, you have to let who they are. Uh, determine a plan of action. And you've got to be sure that your plan of action uh, will not be offensive, you know? Uh, and what happens if all of a sudden we have all these good people out there who understand this? You know something? It looks like to me it's kind of like they dry up a little bit. Their power weakens. Uh, you're absolutely right. Hey, you know what? The, the fields are ripe for harvest because guess where so much of the, of the evil is? Yes, get Go ahead. ready. So much of the evil is in the Protestant churches. Okay. Uh, and <laughs> we're probably you... going to get a lot of angry telephone calls as a result of that. Well, get, but explain yourself so, so much, that I can you know answer. That I, evil... You know, I can always say you said it, so go here. Yeah, right. Get... <laughs> and and but I I say this to Protestant pastors, and um, uh, you know I, I don't I don't bother. Actually, what I say to the Protestant pastors is that you're you're part of the, you're, you've been annexed by the Roman Catholic Church because you're keeping quiet about all this. Exactly. You're so, allowing the people to live in ignorance. And right. Ignorance when either, what evil doing. And then there are many people who have talked about the infiltration of these pastors who have been infiltrated by the Jesuits who actually do go into these churches and try to destroy them. Sure. Uh, so, yes, there is that kind of... Uh, you know, I had a guy, a Baptist minister, just on last week who was talking about that, and he was at the Baptist convention that was going on in North Carolina, and he was saying, you know, uh, it's hard for him uh, to function as a good person in this evil world because the police are constantly hassling him for housing homeless when down the street they're allowing drug dealers uh, to go free and to and to pass on drugs. So, yes, you are so correct when you say it is that, you know, and that pastor, uh, I think understood the same thing you're talking about. He's living in you a see, good I, world. I, you know, there's, there's charity. I've got a problem with the way Americans perceive charity because you know uh, there was a there was a, a woman in the Bible that came to Jesus and said said please help my daughter and Jesus said no I only came to the to the lost sheep of the house, house of Israel and I mean here's Jesus asked to to do a charitable act and he refuses. Of course the lady. Uh, persisted and begged him and, and, and said, you know, you, uh, I, I, she got she got Jesus to to help her, but his initial reaction was not to do anything for her. Why why would he act that way? I'll tell you why. Because he knew that there was a system set up to care for people like that. She didn't show him uh, at first blush. Uh, evidence that she was uh, a member of the, of the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Uh, it was her later testimony, her later, her later confessions, that convinced him that she was worthy of, of that kind of healing. That she was not going to go to the state for her healing. So the state is set up to handle homeless. Many, many charitable organizations, not necessarily churches, are established, uh, uh, are set up to handle homeless. I think the churches uh, have a much more uh, uh, important task, and that is to properly enlighten uh, their congregations as to what's really going on. Uh, here we go with this problem of our financial situation. America seems to be uh, in a position where the economy is about to uh, collapse. Would you agree with that, and how do you handle some a situation like that after knowing who these guys are and discussing, um, you know, what we discussed in this last hour? Well, in the first place, uh, I try to remain as productive as I possibly can. I mean, I'm a musician, and I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, a an author, and I'm a, an artist, and so I, I, I remain productive in these areas and uh, assure that uh, that my time is creating value. So. Once that's decided, how do I handle the money thing? And uh, uh, I just uh, am very careful, especially in light of recent developments, since the M3 is not being announced any longer by the Federal Reserve. Uh, I believe we're going to have just rampant inflation, and I think it's a very, very good idea uh, to to convert uh, whatever dollars you might have into into gold and silver. And uh, or other other precious metals. But I think gold and silver are probably the simplest and most convenient. I like to keep an investment life very simple, as simple as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, that 
mm-hmm. leaves more time to do your productive stuff. So I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not very concerned about uh, a, a crashing economy. If it, if it crashes, it'll crash all around me. Uh, but it's, it's. I don't believe it's going to impact me because I'm going to be productive, and uh, and so there, there'll always be need a need for uh, for the stuff that I do. And so I'm just really not worried. I'm not uh, not too worried about it. And I don't think I don't think I have uh, uh, delusions either. I don't think this is a either this is a false optimism. I think it's really quite real. I can remember you know 40 years ago people were talking about everything was going to crash and nothing really crashed. Things just got uh, a little uh, I don't know a little more evil, a little a little more sleazy. Uh, uh, a, a lot of new newer inventions came about. A lot of beauty was created. A lot of interesting, exciting things came about. Um, and uh, a lot of people got poor, and I think a lot of uh, the wrong people got richer, and that always happens when you have a fluctuating medium of exchange. You have people who can get close to the fountainhead of of, uh, of credit creations, and they really don't do much at all, and they get a lot of money running through their hands. So anyway, in our last minute here, basically you recommend that people read history, read this book, figure out uh, who their enemy is, and then deal with it in a manner that doesn't play into their hands, correct? Exactly. Okay, so I'm done over there in 2006. And exactly some of the things that I remember back in 2006 didn't sit too well with some patriots. And they were saying, and it wasn't exactly the uh, his research on the Vatican. If you go to his book, you can see it's well, it's thorough, it's a good book to have. Put it up against all the other information you have. Some of it jives with other information. Others, it's a much different. So you're going to have to take a look at it, read it, and then make up your own mind, which uh, I really recommend. You know, we got to become free thinkers. But, uh, yeah, people then were saying, well, you know, uh, what does he mean when he means he doesn't, uh, he doesn't uh, you know, upset them? He doesn't want to conf- well, what I'm thinking when and they're not going to bother you unless you do that. Well, here's what I've said many times on the show, and I remember saying to it to him back then, and he agreed. What I said was, yes, I agree with you. You can know who these people are. You can do research calmly and objectively, don't get angry, do this. But I said, I think the line is drawn with these evildoers when you become very, very popular and you have an enormous or you have a very large following that's starting to believe this. And I think, and he agreed. He said, perhaps you got a point there. And I, uh, Tupper's the type of person that would never say that they were targeting him. However, he did pass away two years later, and he was in very good health. But they became popular, so I think we have to kind of amend what he said a bit, and he agreed with me on this, that if you do become very popular, they will target you. And that's because they have to, like he said, keep the status quo. The status quo won't stay the same if millions of people start thinking on their own. And so that's what he was talking about. And when you get into his book, which I've read a number of times, and it is true, it's a book that you can keep by your bedside and go from chapter to chapter. Uh, I I read it through one time, and then it took me a little while because there's a lot of things you want to go back to and look at. And uh, I found that some of the more intriguing parts of a book were when he was talking about how Rome marginalizes the Bible. And then he talked about the Mark of Cain. And he began to talk about some biblical interpretations. Now, some of these, the one on Cain, you don't get anywhere in the in the Protestant churches, anywhere. And I even talked to some people outside of the Protestant churches that uh, were enthused and excited about the way Cain, the Mark of Cain, and the story of Cain and Abel was looked at. And you can go to chapter 24 in his book and get that. And many, many things. I enjoyed the Lorenzo Ricci's 
war. And, the, and I talked to him extensively about the uncovering of this story and how it flies in the face of many people who are researching the Vatican and say, well, you just have to go back to the Founding Fathers and George Washington, and they were opposed to the Vatican, when uh, Tupper and other researchers, including myself even prior to meeting him, felt that they were in the pocket of the Vatican. And that going back to the Founding Fathers, the country was set up to rule evildoers. And it is set up to be a front for freedom, an affront for independence. However, if you, for example, belong to, let's say you are a DHS worker, doing all those evil things according to your government's laws, lying about, you know, look at, just look at the Alamo ministry story, lying about all those kids being abused. They're being ruled by their higher-ups who are evil. They are performing the evil deeds. And the people in the country that are applauding this, numerous people applaud. That's why this Lama ministry story is so important. You can see how these people carved out a life of good. And I suggest that, one, if they had not criticized the Vatican, or if they didn't grow popular, if they remained you know, a small ministry of 10 people whatsoever that didn't reach, they reached millions of people all over the world. This couldn't go on. The status quo was being dented. That's why they were targeted, and Tupper agreed with me on that. And there's others that fall into that category. But according to, and I, I, I agree with him, If the, the idea of the Constitution and the idea of all this stuff, uh, you will not have those protections if you follow this system. And if you think, like he said, the legal system is your way to do it, then good luck to you. And he's right. I mean, I I became I was a, a journal I was a journalist. And I got a law degree. Worked in many law firms. I saw it. There is another avenue where you can live and be free in this country. If you're not being ruled by them. If you don't allow yourself to be, if you don't allow yourself to be confrontational in a sense where you march on them, where you want to fight them, where you get angry, where you're trying to overthrow them, you have no problem. Because the point is, once you understand them, you realize you can't overthrow them. And if you try, what they will say is they'll turn the table on you and say, you are not an American, you don't, and plus, you're a terrorist, and plus, you don't believe in God. If you're doing this because we are we believe in God they hide behind God. God but the question becomes if you understand it why did God give them protection to be there in the beginning with Cain and all of the people that have followed in these governmental roles of leadership why do you think that's happened ask yourself that question I have my own ideas about it maybe I'll bring it up on another show because I only have a couple minutes and I don't have time. But I will say this, there is a reason why God gave Cain and gives all of these leaders protection. And that doesn't sound right, does it? It flies in the face of, you won't hear that on a Protestant pulpit. Because they depict certain leaders as good. They depict our leaders as good. And they use that one phrase, you know, give unto Caesar what is Caesar, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but the point is they're not. They can't be, because they wouldn't be there if they were good. That's why a congressman that goes to office with all these good intentions either joins that evil club, and if he doesn't, he's either killed or he doesn't work there anymore. And the one who stays and says, had all these grandiose ideas of freedom and doing all these things, and he stays in Congress for 20 years, the people in his uh, district will go, how come he doesn't do anything anymore? How come he's, you know, because he has joined the evil club to rule people. Now, they have you in this Hegelian dialectic, and, and we didn't get into that subject. I talked to him over the uh, phone about that. And that's a Jesuit ploy of always working both sides of the coin. 
the art of war, Sun Tzu's art of war, was not translated into French and English for no reason right before the Revolutionary War. And if you think the Founding Fathers are only the ones that you hear about in our textbooks, you're wrong. Because I think Lorenzo Ricci wasn't killed like they, or died in prison like they said he did. And, you know, if you go to uh, the prison where they had him, I've been to Rome, I know exactly the place they're talking about. It's connected to the Vatican. He most likely was given a new, he just changes his identity, and he was considered the professor when he came through the States and talked with Franklin and the rest of them. And there is one book that talks about, outside of this book, that puts him there, puts him there when the history books say he was dead. That, to me, is more plausible than what we read, because you see the fruits, like he said, of what's happened. The beast, since it grew from one diocese before the right after the Revolutionary War, to now it's like encompassing this whole country with culminating with the Pope even coming here to speak to Congress. You know the fruits here, what have happened. We're all out of time. Back tomorrow on the Investigative Journal.